So the chapter starts off with father and Amaterasu. We're seeing father essentially explaining his motives here to her. And I want to say this conversation is one of the more deeper moments that we've gotten so far in this fight, right? And before I actually get into explaining the chapter, I just want to mention this one scene from chapter 56. This is when we see Akononushi come to talk to Bishamon about Sugaha finding out about the god's secret. And to me, this has always been one of the biggest moments in the entire manga for me. When Akononushi tells Bishamon, he says, don't over sell yourself Bishamon. We're not all knowing or all powerful. We're all lacking in some area. That's why there's so many gods, isn't it? So someone can always make up the difference. And I've actually never forgotten about this line because up until this point in the manga, we've been seeing so many gods like ABC try to burden themselves by trying to save the world by controlling phantoms, for example. Or Bishamon who consistently took on as many regalia as she could handle. Or Yato who took on the challenge of becoming this god of happiness. And I think the big bigger picture here is that regardless of how helpful the gods want to be, they'll never have the full ability to save everyone. And it's just like Akunanushi says, it's because they're not all powerful and all knowing. And this is so ironic because this is a god saying this, right? And it's interesting because a father's view of what a god is has always been the complete opposite of this. And a good example of this is how he straight up raised Yato into believing that whatever a god does is right, a god can never make a wrong choice. And if you compare Compare this to real life, it's very similar to actual theology, right? And this is just one of the many reasons I think Noragami is just a straight up masterpiece. The way it shuffles between different systems of faith and comparing them because in monotheism, where the belief is that there is only one god, it's usually the one god who's considered to be all-knowing and all-powerful. And yet in polytheistic religions like Shinto and Noragami or Hindu, this just isn't the case. There isn't just one god, there's many, and they're all worshipped for their own perspective reasons. And I don't want to make this a class on religion, right? But I've just always appreciated how Father takes the view of an all-powerful and all-knowing God that can typically be found in traditional monotheistic religions and then apply that to the world of Noragami where this just isn't the case. Because I've always wondered why does Akononushi say this, right? Because it's not like the idea of an all-powerful, all-knowing, all-perfect being was ever implied to exist in Noragami. But it wasn't until we learned about Father that it made sense that there ultimately was a character who recognized this concept of a god that Akunonushi was talking about. And the reason I'm explaining all of this is because Father is the only one, the only one asking the big question here when he's talking to Amaterasu. He says, crops wither and die from the lack of sun, landslides are brought about by dreadful rainstorms, the earthquakes, the wind howls, the cities burn. So if you bear a human face, what do you think when you see all of this? What do those eyes see? What do those ears hear? What the hell are those hands even for. You've got power and even wealth, and yet if you're just gonna sit there like an old mountain or river, then you might as well admit you're not even trying anymore. This is heaven's sin, and the people who would absolve you of it are complicit. And this is Father ultimately asking, why is there suffering? Why is there evil? Why don't the gods do anything about all this when they have the power for change? And this is probably way beyond Noragami, right? At this point, this is more a question about existentialism, but this is the big question I think Father is making here, but the answer that she gives him is just so mind-blowing. I did not expect Noragami to go this route. And I'm referring to when she says, I have both turned a blind eye and offered my aid. Those like you who take lives are necessary after all. So this is it. This is the answer. And this is just so mind-blowing to me because again, I didn't expect Noragami to get this deep into its theology, right? Because the father laid out his case. He told her that there's no point in the gods existing if not only do they just sit and watch as the world suffers, but but they don't even do anything to help it. And on top of that, the people just forgive them and move on. But what she's saying here is that despite all the evil and suffering done by humanity, she still turned a blind eye. And a perfect example of this is Father himself. Even Father acknowledges that there were times where she witnessed him kill and kill over and over again, but she just ignored it. But not only that, she admits to offering her own aid. And this is interesting because we see a panel from here when she went to go help Yato get out of Yomi. And if if you go back to when this happens, to chapter 37, Yukine says to her, you're from the execution squad, aren't you? Aren't you finished here? And then Amaterasu says, my name isn't worth mentioning. I haven't told anyone why I'm here. And then Yukine says, so why are you here? You know what happened here, right? And then she says, yes, and I know the words you want, but I can't. The heavens are always right. They must never bow to another. I came here because I wanted to come. So it turns out that this was just one example of where she made her own choice to intervene and go against 
against the heavens. Because even though she admits that the heavens were right to execute Abisu, she then goes out of her way to offer them help by explaining to Kotku how to call for Yato out of the underworld. And let me just say, when she responds to Father about turning a blind eye, she's specifically talking about the sins of humanity here. Because it's very clear that Father is against the heavens for things like natural disasters, hunger, and sickness, but Father very conveniently plays the victim here. Because he doesn't mention anything done by humanity, like killing, stealing, lying, torture, he conveniently puts the blame for everything on the gods. But I think Amaterasu's answer is referencing not just the gods, but all of humanity. This is why she admits to turning a blind eye to people like Father but offering her aid. And when we see this flashback of her helping Yato out of the underworld, I think this goes back to how she admitted in the last chapter how necessary Yato is. Because now that it's been implied that Yato has a much bigger role in all of this than what we had originally thought, then you can assume that there are morally justified reasons for allowing Father to exist if there actually is a bigger picture here we just don't know about yet. And this is what I mean about Amaterasu's answer being so mind-blowing because anyone can ask the question, why is there so much evil in the world, right? Why is there so much suffering? But when she tells him, those like you who take lives are necessary after all, it's like she's implying that the evil that happens in the world exists for the bigger picture that Father just doesn't know about. And this goes back to what exactly makes Yato so necessary. Because even though she implied that people like Father who kill are necessary, I just really doubt she means it in the same way that she referred to Yato in the last chapter, right? And even though I keep talking about this bigger picture that we don't know about just yet, I think we pretty much just got it confirmed here in this chapter. Because when we see Amaterasu start to doubt herself and thinking about Heaven's sin, you can notice that Amaterasu starts to look nervous, but also Mikigami as well. And this is important because while her other two Shinki are just downplaying Father and calling him a fool, you can clearly see Amaterasu and Mikigami appear anxious and looking down at their hands. They're both taking the same visual appearance here. And this is interesting because of the three sacred treasures, it's Mikigami who's said to be the mirror. And while the other two are just downplaying Father, it's Amaterasu who actually questions Mikigami about the heaven's sin. And if you go throughout the manga, you'll notice that it's Mikigami who's noticeably more closer to Amaterasu than the other two, probably because she's more than just a mirror. But after Amaterasu has this moment of self-doubting, we see Father get struck by one of Yato's arrows, and by some unknown reason, Amaterasu just gains her confidence back. Because even after Father tries to mock her again by saying, just gonna watch from on a high again, she very confidently says, indeed. And then she leaves after saying, however, it would be excessively permissive of me to allow you to cause this much turmoil. It is wrong to think that only the weak die, but rather the living live and the dead die. And I know I just said that she gained her confidence back after having her moment of self-doubt by some unknown reason, but I think this is where the bigger picture comes in, that it has to be Yato. Because it's almost like she was starting to believe Father for a moment. He even makes fun of her when he notices she starts to look nervous. He says, so you can even make such a face. But then suddenly, it's only after seeing Yato intervene that she decides to not just leave the fight to Yato, but it's also like she reaffirms her disposition to Father, telling him that the living should live and the dead should stay dead. So in other words, it's almost like she felt for a moment that Father was justified to had come back from the dead to punish the heavens for their sin, but it's also like it's only after Yato interrupts the fight that she remembers that Yato's purpose to all of this is what's gonna somehow save the day. So then after Amaterasu leaves, Father has to shield himself from the arrows one of his phantoms go to cover him, but we see him then talking to Mizuchi here. He asks her how she can't find Yato's location even with the serpent's curse still on her wrist. And he's obviously frustrated here calling her stupid and you can see this from Yukine's perspective. It's probably reminiscent of a father verbally abusing his own child. And being stressed by all the chaos, Yukine somehow hears someone or something call for Haru, the name his sister gave him. And deciding to go after the voice, we can see him chase after it in his Hagusa form. And this is interesting because it wasn't clear if Amaterasu had actually broke the Yuki name in the last chapter, but we see Yato notice Hagusa fly out, but he still calls out to him as Seki and then Yukine. So I'm pretty sure Yato would have realized if Yukine's name was broken or else he wouldn't be calling him here, so this is probably confirming that his name seal wasn't broken. And then we cut back to Kofuku and Tenjin. They were talking about Yukine and come to the conclusion that because Yukine is so young, he's probably driven by his wish to see his family overseeing Yato. And because Tenjin became a vengeful spirit after his human death, he knows that better than anyone that Yukine dwelling on his past could lead to him becoming a demon. So this is really interesting because demons in Noragami aren't ever really talked about.
about, right? I mean, I know about Ayakashi, but besides Tenjin, there really is no mention about any mythical demons or Onis, so I hope we get more story on this. I'm curious to see where Tenjin sees this is going or if this is foreshadowing to anything. Because when Tenjin says that really ominous line, he says, to save a child may be outside the realm of possibility. And then we see Yukine reach outside of his sister's house, so it's really only a matter of time at this point until we see Yukine break his limit. I'm curious where the next chapter is gonna go. But I'm gonna end the video here, guys. Thank you so much for watching. And for those of you who are new to my channel, this is actually my third Noragami chapter review, if I remember correctly. I'm gonna be covering the new chapters here every month on a regular basis, so if this is something you want to see, then make sure you subscribe. Please let me know in the comments how you're all feeling about this month's chapter, which you agreed or disagreed with, and please leave a like if you enjoyed the video. I'd greatly appreciate it. And yeah, again, thank you so much for watching, guys. Have a great day.